As you can see, my name is Jeremy Ward. Um, as you can see, I've uh, been in this business rather a long time, 30 years actually this month. I've been doing information security, uh, 18 of them in government and 12 of them in industry. Um, as you can see, I'm from HP. I'm not going to talk about HP, um, so if you've got any problems with your printer or uh, your laptop, please don't come to me because I don't know anything about it. Um, what I am going to talk about is some work that I've been doing uh, with a working group uh, for ENISA. Uh, who here has heard of ENISA? Oh, few people. The European Network Information Security Agency, so it's uh, one of those things that your uh, European um, tax money is, waste, uh, is used for. Um, so ENISA. Um, so what I'm going to talk about really is bring your own device, which I think is probably one of those things that fairly near or at the top of a lot of organizations' agendas at the moment. Um, and really, is it bring your own device or is it going to be bringing your own disaster? I'd be interested to hear from people um, either during the course of the talk, if you think I'm talking nonsense, um, or at the end during the Q&A, um, if we have time, uh, what your own experience in your own organisation is of uh, bringing your own device. It's, um, it's always interesting to hear people's war stories. Um, so, the big security questions, I'm moving out of shot from that camera, no, um, the big security questions, it seems nowadays, are actually essentially around three things. Okay, we've heard about uh, viruses and malware, and in a sense, I suppose you could say those are always with us. But the big questions, it seems now, are really around big data. There's such a lot of data. What do we do with it? How do we structure it? How do we use it? How do we make it effective? The cloud? Yes. We all know it's this cloud thing. What do we do with it? What's the point of it? Is it valuable? Is it secure? And consumerization or bring your own device. And the, the big question is, what effect are those three things going to have on our organizations and the security of our organizations? How are they going to affect that fortress security that we've, uh, that we've been um, hoping to build up over the last few years? And can we, in the face of those things, actually produce protected and protect our information? Now, I think that actually the question is, how do we balance risk and opportunity? This really, to me, is the crucial question that we always have to ask ourselves when we are faced with anything new like big data, like cloud, like bring your own device or consumerization. What are the risks and what are the opportunities and how do we balance the two things? So there you can see in terms of risk I've, um, I've put up a uh, definition of risk which is uh, drawn from the ISO standard on uh, uh, risk assessment and risk management uh, is, it, I, I suppose most of you have probably heard of ISO 27001, 27002. Uh, anybody familiar with 27005? A few people. It's a great standard. Well, I had to say that because I contributed to it. So. Um, so I like this definition of risk. So risk is the potential that a threat will exploit a vulnerability of an asset or group of ass assets and thus cause harm to an organization. So it's, um, it's a nice, simple thing involving three things, threat, um, vulnerability, and harm or impact, negative impact. On the other side of the equation, if you like, you've got opportunities. So here's a definition of an opportunity. It's something unknown, an uncertainty that you hope or you expect has the potential to you enhance your ability as an organization to achieve your objectives. So it's balancing those two things. And this is a little sort of picture 
picture, if you like, of what we're trying to do. So going back to that equation of risk, which is threat, vulnerability, and harm, on the other side of the equation, so together those build up to minimizing your losses and your information security. On the other side of the equation, you've, you've got opportunities advantages and benefits and those are if you like the two sides of the of the risk coin the risk opportunity coin so what we we've got to do in anything in looking at anything like moving to the cloud or or introducing BYOD into our organization we've got to look at finding the threats against finding the opportunities controlling the vulnerabilities and at the same time making sure that the advantages don't run away and actually produce vulnerabilities and managing both the harm that might happen if a threat exploits a vulnerability but also managing the benefits that you get when opportunities exploit if you like advantages to deliver gains for your organization so it's it's a balance and that is really what we should be looking at whenever we consider any new functionality uh, introducing any new uh, technology or process into our organizations we need to minimize the negatives and maximize the positives so with that in mind um, let me take you through some of the work that we've been doing in this this working group of INISA that's been looking at consumerization so we've uh, identified what we think are the opportunities for bring your own device in an organization so we divide them essentially into into three groups um, the first one is financial so um, bringing your own device or allowing people to bring their own device in can lead to some financial advantages or opportunities for the organization because we think um, it can lead to increased productivity if people are happy with using their own device rather than something that you give them then they're hopefully going to be more productive reduce spending hmm that's an interesting one we could debate that because actually there could be other things on the other side of the equation it may look cheaper to allow people to bring their th own devices in but actually there may be some equivalent negativities around that as well increase customer satisfaction well possibly yes if you can deliver more um, services to your customers more quickly more on site talking to them more interactively then potentially there are um, some uh, financial advantages to that in terms of human resources well again if people are using what they're comfortable with what they're happy with then they're going to be better motivated um, we want to attract the best staff to our organization the best staff are likely to be the sort of people who would want to use a device that they're happy with that they are used to that they're comfortable with so we can attract better staff we can increase potentially job satisfaction by allowing them to use something which uh, makes them feel more productive which they can use anywhere anytime any place and so on so there's some advantages and opportunities there um, operationally there could be opportunities for um, increasing the availability of resources if somebody's got a device with them all the time they're obviously going to have an increased availability uh, better communication and collaboration I think is pretty obvious that uh, if everybody is networked together using handheld devices then potentially you've got better communication and collaboration and of course increased workplace flexibility in increasingly of course you don't have to have everybody together in the same place working together in in, in a big building you can have them uh, distributed you can have them working from home and so on so workplace flexibility is a potential opportunity that can be exploited by um, bringing your own device 
Finally, there could be some advantages or opportunities around data management because you could share data more eff efficiently and effectively, which comes from the communication and collaboration. Um, Increased data accuracy, well, if you are inputting data on the spot rather than having to write something down, then going back to your laptop or your desktop to, to, to uh, enter that data, then potentially there could be gains in data accuracy. Better oversight and control of the flow of data, well, again, you know, if, uh, if you have things and you know where people are with them, uh, they're registered through their GPS system and you, you, you can control the flow, potentially there is an opportunity to do that there. So, there are some opportunities. We can talk about those, we can discuss those, whether you really think there are opportunities, but, you know, concomitantly, they might bring some risks as well. So, in the working party, we've identified uh, a number of risks that uh, balance, perhaps, those opportunities. So, in terms of financial risk or cost risk, <coughs> if people are using their handheld devices and those smart devices, there is a greater risk of brand devaluation by people um, doing things that are ill-advised using those devices. Uh, making remarks on Twitter, um, putting stuff on Facebook uh, that will potentially devalue your brand. Increased management cost from having multiple devices. If you're uh, an organization and you know, in the past you either had desktops or you had a few laptops that you issued to people. If you allow them to bring their own laptops, their own handheld devices, iPads and so on, you've got an enormous potential risk there from a huge range of stuff that you've got to support with a huge new range of applications and systems that you have to support as well. So there's a potential risk there for increased management costs, I'm sure you would agree. Um, the more portable devices people have, the more they're going to lose. So there's a cost of replacing them and potentially replacing the data that's lost with them. We'll talk about data later. And finally, uh, increased security spending to prevent device misuse. So obviously, if you've got a lot of mobile devices around there, you've got to think, how are we going to prevent device misuse? We've got to put on lots of things like we were talking about earlier um, in order to wipe the device if somebody loses it. Uh, you might have mobile device management systems on it. There's an increased cost associated with all those things that you've got to think about in, um, implementing on the devices. Um, so those are the cost ones, and I think, you know, all of those are pretty obvious, or would be pretty obvious with a bit of thought. Legal and regulatory things, and we're when I get, going to have some legal and regulatory discussions later, but I think in terms of bring your own device, there are some interesting issues, uh, legally and regulatorily, if you like. Um, weaker corporate governance control over user-owned devices. If you know, this is my phone, but I'm using it, or my handheld device, but I'm using it for corporate use. Who owns the data that I'm creating on it? You know, there's some interesting issues around that. Who, you know, who controls that? Who governs that? So there are some interesting things that need to be thought about. And that really goes down to the, the, the sort of uh, uncertainty over ownership and how you control the data and who owns the data. And it's really all about this confusion that could potentially lead you into litigation. So presumably, you know, if um, you said, okay, I'm going to wipe your device because I think you're misusing it, what if you wiped all the personal data that somebody had on that device. They might have photographs, they might have, you know, lots of important 
information that related to them personally. What would happen if you wiped that? You could potentially find yourself in, in a process of litigation around that, particularly, of course, if you're in the USA. Um, so there are legal and regulatory issues that need to be considered. And finally, of course, there's the, the corporate data loss issues or risks that need to be considered. So obviously data loss can come from a number of sources. Uh, unauthorized data sharing, so if you've got a device it's very easy to send data to people that you shouldn't be sending it to. If you thought about it, it's too easy to send stuff. It's easy to share devices with people um, and thus potentially lose data. Um, unauthorized access to purely poorly secured devices so and, and applications if you leave it lying around very easy to do people can gain access to things because it is much more difficult to ensure security on user-owned devices or uh, devices that you don't fully manage or control then there is the potential for greater loss of data and of course you know if you've got a very nice smartphone or something, it's going to be a target for theft. And, of course, it's going to be the target for an attack as well. So there is the potential for significant loss of corporate data through those things. Everyone with me so far? Okay, good. It's all pretty obvious stuff. So... Uh, what we did was we looked at these risks and we looked at these opportunities and we sort of tried to, to balance them or put them together in the way that I was uh, indicating earlier. So we've got the, the, the cost type risks here, the legal and regulatory type risks and the data loss type risks. And we, we said, okay, um, in relation to the opportunities that we've uh, identified, i.e. the financial opportunities, the human resource um, opportunities, the operational and the data management opportunities, how do these relate? Are they major risks to the opportunities or minor risks to the opportunities? And I think you can, you can see here that the, the, the major risks are all really around data management. Um, less perhaps around, around cost, although, again, you know, all these things are, are frankly interrelated. So, I mean, if you, if you have significant data loss, that could result in significant cost as well. But essentially what we're saying here is, I think you can see, that the major risks are mostly around data loss. Okay? Is that sort of... Clear. Right. So, we're, we've actually written a paper about this, uh, which will be published, I'm assured. The um, thing about INISA is that it tends to work very slowly. The paper was written back in June. It still hasn't been published. Um, if you're interested, it will be published soon, I'm assured, by, uh, certainly by next month, um, on the um, INISA website, uh, the, the risk management bit of the website. Um, that's the uh, the names of the people who are in in the um, in the working group, by the way. Um, so you can see it's a fairly um, eclectic mix of people from from around the uh, European Union. Um, so that paper will be published soon. So I encourage you to to have a look at it. Which really, I've just summarised what 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 what's in that paper. So what we're working on now, and everything else I'm going to show you now is sort of provisional, is around risk mitigation. So how do we, so we've got these risks, we can see what opportunities or failings that they're, they're potentially targeting, so how do we mitigate those risks? So we've, we've sort of divided this up, as I say, this is all provisional. Um, into a number of, of areas of mitigation. So the first one I'm, I'm calling governance, sort of general governance uh, mitigation actions that you can take around um, bringing your own device. So the first thing is um, for various legal and regulatory reasons mainly 
you should ensure that any bring your own device scheme that you set up in your organization has got to be an opt-in one and not an opt-out i.e. you can't make it compulsory you have to say if you want to opt into it that's fine but you have to actually clearly opt in um, the second thing is that you've got to incentivize the, your users to accept controls over their devices. So in other words, think about you know, what controls we need, how do we make sure that users are going to accept these and make sure they use them. So in other words, make sure that the, um, the incentive is that you get a better device if you accept the controls or um, you um, the controls go with additional functionality or something like that. You, you, you've got to think about how you would incentivize them to accept the fact that you are putting controls onto their devices. Um, and develop a compliance process to ensure that those controls are in place and people are complying with your rules and processes for using their devices. Fourthly, and I think probably the most important one of all the, the mitigations here, communication, education, and developing a corporate culture around the use of, of, of bring your own device. So if you're go, going to introduce bring your own device, make sure that it fits into your corporate culture and make sure that people are aware of the risks, aware of the opportunities, but also what they need to do to make sure those opportunities can be realized and not destroyed by the risks that we've identified. So corporate culture, education, awareness, all those good things um, really are very, very critical to developing a successful BYOD program, I think. Then, of course, you know, okay, inevitably things are going to go wrong. What are you going to do? Have you got an incident response process in place that's going to say, okay, lost the device, how can we wipe it? What do we do? What data was on it? Do we know what the risk is? You've got to have an incident response process and audits in place. So that you audit, you've issued a device to somebody, somebody you, you think has got a device, have they still got it? Are they using it? What are they using it for? You've got to be able to make sure you can audit what's happening. Uh, second thing is applications. Obviously, one of the great advantages of, of, of new devices is um, how you use applications, the ability to use these wonderful new applications on them. So, um, we think probably one of the most important things is to ensure that the configuration of the device and the applications it uses has got to be managed by the organization and not by the user. So, you, you you know, you've got to restrict the number of applications because people are going to say, oh, that looks an interesting application, and of course it turns out that it's a very dangerous, from a uh, security point of view, type application. So really, that, that relates back to the incentivization and to the communication and, uh, and um, education program. Um, there are bridge technologies that, that, that can be used. I'm, told, I'm not a technologist. Um, they can be used for access where applicable. Um, perimeter architecture. Uh, yeah, I mean, legacy systems, perimeter architecture, very difficult to change. Um, how can you do it? Well, try not to do it in one big bang, try and do it in small steps, perhaps using the uh, transition to IPv6, if you are, um, as an excuse for, for taking those steps to change your perimeter architecture. Um, device management. Now, I think this one, it, personally, I think this is critical. Devices must be owned by the organization not by the individual. And I think that is absolutely critical for legal standardization and compliance issues. If, if the individual is o owns the device, then you potentially get into all sorts of litigation and, and, and problems and issues. So I think that is, is, is a very important risk mitigation one. 
Mobile device management, MDM, suites, yes, they're useful, but they, they've got to be combined uh, with uh, some architecture redesigned, um, redesign. Uh, it, on, in themselves, they can be useful, but actually they need um, more than just the MDM suite. Risk assessment. Um, I've gone on about risk assessment for many years. It is absolutely critical and it is really critical to these things here because you need to understand what is critical. Whose device is critical? Are you protecting that? Are you allowing that access, as my American colleagues say, into the chocolate, i.e., you know, what devices are getting access to the really critical systems and applications that you have on your corporate network? Have you done that risk assessment and assessed the risk of allowing those devices into those critical applications and systems? Uh, secure connection uh, compliant to uh, your best practice security standards. Obviously, if you're allowing any device to access critical uh, systems. Device support, well that sort of goes with the territory of device management, but essentially you've got to say, okay, we're not for obvious reasons, going to support every single possible device that's out there, because there's just too many of them. We're only going to support a, a limited number of devices. But again, you know, you've got to You've got to couple this with your communication, your incentivization, your corporate culture and education and so on. Um, so, what you should do, obviously, is standardize on something that people are going to be happy to use. It's no use standardizing on something that nobody wants to be seen dead with because it doesn't give them any street cred. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to standardize on something that is, people are going to want to use, but is also going to be secure and securely configurable, obviously. Um, internet services and applications, okay. You know, people are going to use Twitter and Facebook. You know, that, they, they are. So recognize it, live with it, but make sure that you engage with your legal department, if you have one, with your human resources people to make sure that they're on side and they understand the implications, and that goes back again to your education, awareness, and corporate culture, and so on and bring all these things under a, a governance program which says this is what we, we're allowing, this is what we're not allowing. If you're going on Twitter and Facebook and you're using one of our devices, these are the sort of things you're allowed to do and these are the sort of things you're not allowed to do and that sort of thing. A governance program. Legal, regulatory and human resources controls. Obviously, if you're in a, a, an organization with a widespread geographic variation, then you've got to recognize there's going to be differences from country to country. Um, this is an interesting one, the second one. Okay, if you're allowing people to bring their own device, then you've got to make sure that you're paying for it so that you have a measure of legal control. Uh, finally, end user data access, risk management again. Risk management. What data is that device going to access? How critical is that? What are they going to do with it? Can you be, you know, sure that the sort of person who you've given access to that critical data is going to be the sort of person who's going to treat that data in the way it should be treated? Data leakage protection, yes, great stuff. Use it throughout the system, not just in patches. Encryption technology, yes, use it where applicable, where possible. Again, couple that with risk management because, you know, encryption is a great thing, but it can be a pain as well. So, you know, it all comes down to the risk, balancing the risk, user incentivization. If the user really is the sort of person who
cannot be bothered to use encryption uh, or finds it difficult or has a problem with it, then you need to think about what the risk is of allowing them into your critical applications. And enforce data protection law compliance. Absolutely critical. DPA, um, you know, we're seeing more and more violations of it. That's got to be borne in mind more and more particularly when you're using um, your own uh, mobile uh, user-controlled devices. Okay, um, so, <laughs> sorry, it's a long, boring table, but what, what, what I've tried to do, again, this is provisional, um, so this hasn't been agreed by the group. Uh, what I've tried to do here is to say, okay, here are the risks that we talked about earlier, um, how do the mitigations affect those risks? And I've sort of put three ticks for, um, for uh, really very effective, two for pretty effective, and one for somewhat effective. Um, so it's, this is purely my, um, uh, my assessment, I have to say. So I think that in, in those terms, I think that provisionally, the sort of things that you should be looking at, most importantly, are governance and device management controls. Then end user data access management, um, your device support, legal and regulator, and so on down the list. So that's how I would rank things based, as I say, on, on that table there. Um, that's all I've got to say on the subject based on, as I say, the work that we've done so far in the INISA working group on consumerization. Thank you very much.